Welcome everyone to the My Health 2 series in partnership with Moffitt Cancer Center and the Black Alumni um, Society. We'll get started in one minute. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining the My Health 2 series um, in partnership with Moffitt Cancer Center. The USF Black Alumni Society will be starting in just one minute. We're giving everyone an opportunity to join. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining the My Health 2 webinar series where you get an opportunity to ask the doctor your questions. Um, this is in partnership with Moffitt Cancer Center and the USF Black Alumni Society. Thank you, everyone, once again. And we're gonna go ahead and get started with our moderator for today, who's gonna be Lashante Keys, as well as both of our doctors that you'll love to hear and ask all of your questions. That's going to be Dr. Blue and Dr. Ewing. All right. Well, good afternoon, everybody. Welcome, 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 welcome to USF Black Alumni Society in partnership with Moffitt Cancer Center. This week, we'll present three informative days of much needed conversation in the black community. On Wednesday, December 9th, we'll focus on health and oral screenings. And on Thursday, December 10th, integrative health. But today, we will discuss cancer screening and prevention with Dr. Blue and Dr. Ewan, both with the Moffitt Cancer Center. If we can, I'm gonna allow both of them to give a brief introduction of who they are and how they represent Moffitt. So we'll start with Dr. Ewing, and then obviously we'll go with Dr. Blue. Hi, uh, thank you for the opportunity to join today uh, on this panel to talk about cancer screening and prevention in the Black community. My name is Aldenise Ewing. I am a postdoctoral research fellow at Moffitt Cancer Center. I completed my PhD in public health from the University of South Florida. I've been engaged in colorectal cancer screening for about the last six years, and I'm very passionate about um, addressing health disparities and health inequities within the Black community. Thank you, and I am Dr. Blue. I am a, a medical oncologist and hematologist. Uh, I see patients with uh, blood-related uh, cancers uh, at Moffitt Cancer Center, and so um, you know, I'm pretty much well-versed in pretty much all the cancers that uh, we can talk about today, and uh, I see patients, and uh, hopefully you never have to come see me, but if your loved one does have to come see me, they're in good hands, okay? I'm actually from uh, the Tampa Bay area. I uh, was uh, from St. Petersburg, and I actually went to Lakewood High School. <clears throat> and we'll discuss Lakewood High School later. But <laughs> <laughs> as a native of St. Petersburg, Bogusaga High School here. Uh, but again, we thank you all for being here, and, we, and, and please, to the people in the audience, Take advantage. This is an opportunity that you really have to ask questions and to get some honest opinion. And they'll tell you as much as they can, but they'll also let you know if they cannot tell you certain things as well. But please take advantage of these conversations. You can't get this free advice anywhere else. And so again, we thank Moffitt Cancer Center for this partnership with USF Black Alumni. And we're actually gonna get right into a, a series of questions. So the first question is, how much does cancer affect minorities? Yeah, so I can uh, jump in and begin um, with that particular question. So um, what we have learned from COVID-19 is that different uh, communities are impacted in different ways. Cancer, unfortunately, is no different where the Black community and other minority groups, including American Indian, Alaska Native groups, do face disadvantages um, and poor health outcomes when it does relate to cancer in particular. Um, again, my focus is colorectal cancer. And we do know with colorectal cancer, African-Americans are about 20% more likely to be diagnosed with colon cancer and also have less favorable outcomes as it relates to mortality. Um, but on a brighter side, um, there is a way to prevent colorectal cancer. And I can share more about that later. 
Yeah, you know, I think in general, uh, the problem is, unfortunately, that um, in the minority community, you pick a cancer. We don't do it. We're not doing great uh, in any uh, category, okay? So if you pick lung cancer, breast cancer, colon cancer, prostate cancer, any of those cancers that you see on TV or that you see people wearing ribbons for or any of those kind of commercials on television, um, when they say that people are living longer and doing better, a lot of times they don't look like me and you, okay? They're really some people who are having a hard time um, and we're, we're running a race and uh, we're, we're, we're definitely in last place, okay? And so hopefully with some information that we uh, talk about today, hopefully we should be able to help uh, kind of shed some light because, you know, honestly, um, we got to close the gap, okay? And, and, and it starts by education. And so I think that's part of the reason for having this talk today. So really, you pick any, any cancer, um, but really for the most part, we are um, not doing great. Okay. Dr. Ewan, you kind of got our, you kind of got the, everybody's interest. I know he says how to, how to prevent it. Give us some tips on how, 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 do, we, how do you prevent it? Yeah, so there are several different um, things you do to prevent cancer. Let me just start with um, one that I think is probably something really important that we neglect, and that's having conversations with your family members about your own family history. Um, so knowing what you personally might be at risk for based on your genetics, um, because your genetics do place you at uh, risk for certain conditions. Um, as it relates to colorectal cancer, only about 10% of those cancers are related to hereditary causes. Um, there are other factors that might place somebody at risk. Um, individual factors, smoking. Um, smoking relates to 12 different types of cancers. Smoking is bad for you. Um, and if at all um, costs, if there's anything that you could do to prevent cancer, that of course is is right there with knowing your family history, but preventing um, smoking, so smoking cessation. Also, um, engaging in alcohol use and also um, less healthy or nutritious diets, diets that are low in fiber, um, diets that are lower in consumption of fruits and vegetables, those as well might place you at risk for um, cancer. So there are several different things, but I think um, I talked with Dr. Blue about this, but in this holiday season, one thing that we can do is talk to our family members about our family history uh, for certain conditions and just become more knowledgeable about what we are at risk for on a personal level. Yeah, so I just want to comment on that, you know, just because, uh, you know, a lot of times we know what's good for us and what's not bad, not good for us. But but just think about it. Those same foods um, that people tell you can lead to diabetes a lot of times can also lead to cancer. OK, mm -hmm. so, for example, sausage, you know, mm -hmm. so we call processed food, you know, it don't come out of animal looking like that. Right. <laughs> what they call, you know, hot dogs you know, um, beans and weenies, you know, stuff that we eat all the time, uh, bacon, you know, uh, these are what they call processed food, ham, all the stuff that was on your plate, what, two weeks ago uh, for Thanksgiving, you know, I mean, that stuff in excess really can cause problems, okay, and the problem is, is that, you know, what we consider a good meal, you know, it could be every Saturday or Sunday morning, you could be eating some of this stuff, right, so now imagine that, for 50 years, right? You're eating, you know, heavy sausages, heavy, you know, all, all these what we call processed food. Your body can't absorb that and can't what we call metabolize or break some of that stuff down and it causes problems. And unfortunately, one of the major side effects of that is cancer. And so, um, you know, I think really what we got to do in order to help prevent this, we got to have like a societal minority shift on like what we think is good foods bad foods you know i used i grew up and i'll just be honest people used to call certain foods bird food or rabbit food you know like oh i'm not eating that rabbit food you know it's like no like these green leafy vegetables some of that stuff we we and, and when we do it we don't got to put ham hogs in the stuff that's green you know what i mean and so so it, it's really some small stuff that we got to do as a people as a culture in order to kind of change some of this stuff because it's really killing us and really uh, causing cancer. And, it's, and as uh, Dr. Ewing mentioned, it's, it's preventable. And so that's just my two cents. So explain to me, how do you have those conversations? Like, how, what is the best way to have those conversations? Like, you know, I think they always say, if you know better, you do better. Mm -hmm. And some of us do know better. And we try to 
have that conversation with our family members, but it just doesn't go anywhere. So how would you recommend having those type of conversations? It's not easy, man. It's not easy because think about it, right? Like the smell of like, I don't know, bacon cooking could remind you of your grandmama house, right? So now you're telling your brain what was a good memory to you. Like, hey, I'm, I'm remembering grandma who might not be here anymore as, hey, maybe this might not be the best thing for me, okay? But these are what we call generational problems that have been passed down. And honestly, grandma was probably trying to do her best, right? You know, with what she had and with the information we had. But you know, honestly, in the last 20 years, you know what we got? The internet, right? That wasn't around when grandmama was around. That wasn't around when even your parents were around, okay? This is something that is new, that we have more information. We don't have an excuse anymore, you know, because before, as we all know the history of some of the things that have happened in America, unfortunately, we weren't taught certain things, okay? And we didn't have access to equal education. I mean, it's a whole list of things. But now we have access, right? There, There is the what they call the World Wide Web. Okay, so all you have to do is just Google some things that could really help be a lot. And, and honestly, these are simple, small things, right? And, and it, well, I don't want to call it simple because it's a whole shift from, from thinking, but it is a simple thing to do uh, that you can try to do um, to, to really make some change. And so that, that's my two cents. Yeah, um, I'll just add though, regarding food, my family in particular, and there are, I'm sure many others in the Black community, we really take pride in who prepares what dishes for the holidays, right? So Thanksgiving, uh, it's a big deal if you get the dressing, the mac and cheese, you know, certain dishes, and the same thing for Christmas. Um, so I, I do have three other sisters, and and uh, my mom, I think, took great pride in passing down recipes. Uh, but Dr. Blue talked about, um, you know, generational things. And so one thing my sisters and I um, like to do is to alter the recipe just just a little bit, you know, not to really upset any type of uh, holiday happiness. But what we have learned, of course, you know, from our education and from the internet is that certain things might not be as healthy for us. And so what we do is for this holiday meal, we can sacrifice a little bit, you know, of those traditions of what we used to do and, and alter recipes to make them a little bit healthier. And hopefully, you know, our family members do like those and then they might you know start to incorporate those in their their meal their diet moving forward so when you talk about what can you do somebody you know be brave enough to be that person to consider altering you know recipes just a little bit to try something healthier definitely so definitely lead by example is key and i can tell that you cook dr ewan because you didn't say <laughs> stuffing you said dressing oh yeah so i do so i do appreciate that so good looking out on that one i'm from the south so i understand <laughs> completely when it Ooh, so All right. Good. Sounds good. Sounds good. We do have a question that has come in. Um, and it is, my, my mother has bladder cancer, but has chosen not to have it removed. She started with chemo and now has moved to Keytrid. Keytrid. I may be saying that wrong. The Keytrid has caused her a horrible rash all over her body, which they are now treating, as well as it has thrown off her kidney readings. The treated physician wants to stop the key the Keytruda and put her back on chemo three weeks on when we got. She's 83 years old. I'm not sure she would survive the heavy doses of chemo. Is there a way I can get a second opinion on her treatment from Moffitt? She's currently being treated at Sylvester Center in Delray, Florida. Yeah, um, so that's a great question. Uh, if you don't mind me taking this out, Janice. Uh, but basically, um, here at Moffitt, we see patients from all over the world, okay? Uh, we are a world class cancer center and we'll be happy to see your mom we'll be happy to look at her case and we'll do what we call personalized medicine right so what might be good for everybody might not be the best for you and your family okay um there's some places out there that do offer what we call cookie cutter medicine meaning that like the first patient comes they get this the second patient that comes they get this the third patient but that's really not what we do here at Monfort. we will look on things on what we call an individual case-by-case -case basis and we'll be happy to see her okay um of course um all you would have to do is just kind of call and kind of make an appointment, okay? Uh, the best number that, uh, if you're okay with me sharing that right now, um, but the best number that we could call, that you could call to reach us is 813 is our area code here in Tampa, 745-8000. Okay, so that's 813 is the area code, 745-8000. We'll be happy to see her. Of course, like I said, one of the medications that she's on, that K-Truda has really worked well in a lot of other cancers, but it's not for everybody, okay? And so um, 
you know, just because something is the latest and greatest doesn't always mean that it's the best thing for your uh, loved one. So give us a call. We'll be happy to see her and we'll be happy to kind of give individualized uh, treatment recommendations. Thank you. And I just want to commend you as her um, daughter, her, her relative for advocating for her, for looking into, you know, the second opinion, uh, for not giving up, for keeping on. Uh, that's very, very important as well. All right. Another question from the audience. I'm a 60 year old male for my annual prostate screening. Should I insist on a digital rectal exam or is the PSA blood test sufficient? So uh, again, if you don't mind me taking this one out, Denise, but uh, yeah, so uh, typically, uh, and, and of course, I don't know your background, but if you are a person of uh, a minority uh, person, we do tend to have more aggressive and kind of at risk um, uh, prostate cancer. So typically we recommend both. Uh, just because, um, you know, we are the highest risk population, if that makes sense. And so if you choose to uh, sometimes just do one or the other, sometimes things can get missed. And so what we what we choose to do, especially in, in like I said, I don't know your background, so I'm just making assumptions. You know, this is a um, minority health kind of talk. But but if you are a person from a minority community, uh, I would recommend both um, just because um, you are at a higher risk population than other uh, groups of people. All right. Another question from the audience. And like I said, keep them coming because it's, it's great advice that we're getting. Our next question is, should we be doing more frequent prevention screenings than is typically recommended? So I think normally for black males that is recommended to get a prostate screening at 40, I think it changes. I think some say 40, some say 44, some say 45. You know, should we be doing more frequent prevention screenings than typically recommended? I can jump in and start here. Um, so I think, you know, we want to be cautious of uh, over-medicalizing, over-treating ourselves. There are definitely um, professional recommendations on when we should begin screening. Uh, for African Americans, even for colorectal cancer, that's at 45. However, that's only if you're at average risk. If you're at higher risk, if you have a family history or certain conditions, then you should begin earlier. So before I think we even talk about cancer screening, we have to even go back and talk about, are you going in for your routine screenings? Do you have a relationship with your provider? Are you going in, you know, between one to three years? And does your doctor know your history and what you could be at risk for? So before we kind of jump, you know, to something that is considered chronic disease and, and a little occurs a little bit later in life. What are you doing to manage your your health and your well being on a consistent basis? Because that of course is gonna influence what you will need later on in life. Yeah, you know, and the only thing I'll echo with that and just say honestly, you gotta be your best advocate, right? Mm -hmm. So um, you know <clears throat> If someone is saying that, hey, you might not need this, you need to be the one to say, yeah, I think I might need it. You know what I mean? Uh, and so that's a hard thing to do, right? Because this guy, well, I don't want to say guy, but this person comes in in a white coat, right? And they kind of have this kind of authoritative or uh, what we call paternalistic uh, view, you know, what it like obviously this guy know what he's talking about. He has a white coat on. So you kind of have the tendency, especially sometimes in minority community, kind of be a little bit more um, subdued, right? And you kind of say, okay, well, this guy told me this. But really, honestly, if we keep it at 100, is that the stuff that these people are telling you sometimes don't necessarily apply to your community, right? So some of these guidelines are generalized guidelines, right? But as you know, especially for the Black community, we make up about 11 to 13% of the the population so they're not really include they're talking about the 90 not the 10 percent right and so what you want to know is for your particular self what's in your best interest right because you we only got one life to live right and so you want to make sure that you make the best use out of it so what uh, i think someone had already mentioned before like if if your doctor is saying something and you maybe read something that might be a little bit different than that what other communities do they get second opinions even on pre-cancer you know, and so I'm telling you, like, like we are, our doors are wide open. Okay. We'll be happy to kind of like, if you're like, Hey, I think I have this concern for this problem. I think we mentioned the, the phone number on there before, but we see people at Moffitt, even though we are a cancer center, we see people who have pre-cancers. Okay. Because we want to make sure that, you know, as that train is rolling down the tracks towards cancer, that you're not steering off the track and that somebody might not be telling you something that's not 
accurate, okay? We have what we call world-class researchers here, so the latest and greatest information, we, mo we, up to we write textbooks on what's happening, okay? So uh, I can't say that for other places, you know? Not saying that other places are bad, but I do want to say that I, I can speak for what we do here. Uh, and what we do here is we really try to make sure that what's best for you is done, uh, whether you have cancer or sometimes you might think you have something. We actually do a full assessment and actually say that, hey, you really don't have what they said you had. So, I mean, it's just it's just that I can't stress it enough. If there's a concern, if there's some area, um, just seek help. OK, uh, especially um, if you're, like I said, in a minority community, because we're at the highest risk, you can't just leave things to chance or just sit back and just hopefully things will work out. You got to be a little bit more active and just say, hey, let me be in the driver's seat so I can help, you know, drive myself to uh, excellent cancer care. And I, and I think you made a great point. So I, I, we've seen in our community where, you know, your grandparents are 60 something years old and their doctor is 80 something years old but they, they still have that loyalty to that doctor and don't want to change doctor because they've been with them for so long um so i think you bring up a good point about getting second opinions and you know and, and challenging it and challenging because there's a respectful way that you can challenge your doctor but i think one thing we have to do is empower our community to understand there are more doctors out there than just that one doctor and if you're not liking what you're getting go get a second opinion just like the person put up earlier about getting a second opinion, go get a second opinion. And it's not, it's not gonna hurt anybody's feelings. It may just cause your loved one to be here a little bit longer and not suffer as much. So if you're not liking it, like Dr. Blue said, go get that second opinion, challenge it in a respectful way. Here's another question from the audience. And working with clinical trials, I have noticed that African-Americans are least likely to participate in clinical trials. How can healthcare professionals encourage aid and black cancer patients receiving the same assistance that other races have? I think that's a loaded question, um, <clears throat> right? It's, it's very complicated because I think with my knowledge in public health, I couldn't just sit, sit here and say, you know, African-Americans immediately need to participate. What I will say is they first need to educate themselves on that clinical trial. I think that uh, the researchers who are conducting the clinical trials need to make more intentional efforts to educate these communities, the black community in particular, because we know the history of some of these unethical trials uh, that, ha that have been conducted, right? So I think, you know, even though that was generations ago, Blacks today still feel like we are looked at as, you know, mice in an experiment. And so you have to understand that that's a valid concern. That's a valid feeling. And you have to figure out how you're going to address that, right? So again, educating, you know, doing as much as you can with actual community outreach. A lot of us never grew up seeing, you know, researchers who looked like us who were leading these clinical trials. I know with the COVID-19 vaccine, there has been, um, you know, good media out there showing, you know, a black woman who was on the forefront of some of the studies going on for that vaccine. That piques my interest. That leads me to want to learn more about what she's doing. So I definitely think there are intentional efforts that needs to be made on the researcher side. And then also in the black community side, you know, we have to understand that science technology does advance and there are things out here that can help us. Um, and so we have to be willing to go out there um, to, again, talk to our doctors to learn more about these clinical trials and then to understand that, yes, the, there are scientific advances that would place us in better um, health outcomes. I'm a, I'm, I'm a, only thing I want to say to piggyback on that. So the through science and through research, it shows that if you are on a clinical trial, you will do better than those who are not on clinical trial. That is something that is in the, in the scientific community proven. And you say, well, why is that? When you're on a clinical trial, you have people who are calling you, checking to make sure that you come into your appointment, that you know when your appointment is. So, so let's just use an example. You're not on a clinical trial. You have, you know, some cancer, let's just call it breast cancer. You come in, you see the doctor. I say, hey, this is going to be the chemo plan. You walk out the door, you schedule your appointment, you get your chemo sessions and it's done. But now on the clinical trial, you not only have me as the doctor involved, you have a lot of times like a social worker involved. A lot of times you have what we call a clinical research coordinator. You have like all these different pieces of the puzzle that 
that you wouldn't necessarily have access to. And so these people are like, you know, really like, you know, any question you have, not saying that the doctor is not always available, but sometimes we just can't be everywhere. And so you just have these other pieces of, uh, of a puzzle that really kind of make things uh, work better. Uh, and so not only that, sometimes with some clinical trials, they even provide transportation vouchers. So like, you know, if you, um, I don't know, you run out of gas or something, you say, hey, coming to Moffitt is too far. Sometimes they give you like gas, um, what do you call it, gas cards to come. Um, so, so being on a clinical trial should be, I think the way we think about it should be looked up as a good thing. Um, because really what we're trying to do is only kind of make things better. OK, uh, and uh, the, the, the number one question I get is, hey, I don't want to be a guinea pig. Uh, and so, you know, I think just rebranding um, clinical trial and, and really for everyone who's out there listening, I encourage all my patients to do it. And the reason why is that, um, you know, a lot of things are known, but not necessarily known for people who look like you. OK, so the more people that we have, there's I mean, there's trials that have shown that they thought a, a drug was going to work. And it actually worked better in blacks or worked less in black. You know, like, like there's a certain, like what's good for everybody, uh, what, what they think is good for everybody may not be. And so there might be certain subset of populations of people, including minorities, who really might have a different experience. So before this drug comes on the market and somebody's like, oh, this is the latest and greatest and puts your grandmama on this pill, you might want to say, hey, it's been tested in people who look like me, right? And so that's, that's what I think is a, is a great thing. It's something that we got to do because even if it doesn't benefit you, right? You got sons, you got grandchildren, you got nieces, you got nephews. And so at some point, God forbid, they get cancer down the road. They're going to be like, oh, you know what? Grandma was, was one of the ones who made sure this drug didn't get approved because it didn't, it had zero efficacy in black folks. And that happens. So, but, but there's no, I mean, there's no way for these companies to know that, um, you know, without us getting involved. And so, um, and so, like I said, it's just, it's just a major way that we make progress in America. And so I really encourage people um, to, to truly try to make that effort. And if you can, just sticking on that, if you can, I think one of the fears that a lot of African Americans have in community and doing clinical trials is they're not protected. If we look back on history, you can see a lot of things where things were done underhandedly, that people weren't disclosed. Can you explain some of the documentation that now goes into place that protects you if you do take a, take advantage of being a part of a clinical trial? Yeah, so part of um, ethical research involves something called the Institutional Review Board. So anytime that researchers um, develop a protocol, protocol is basically the book that um, is going to lay out what a research study is. Anytime they develop that protocol and it involves human subjects for participation, they have to send that through a review process, um, an extensive review process. And once that is approved, uh, then the study moves forward. Now with clinical trials, there is much more time involved than just the review of a protocol. Those trials oftentimes go through years of um, FDA approval and different processes. And then also when it comes to you, the patient or the participant, you have what's called an informed consent. That informed consent is gonna share information about the research study, the personnel that's involved, any contact information, where to go if you have questions. Take advantage of that. If you do have questions, even, you know, okay, who is this person? and what is their background and, you know, why are they running this study? Ask those questions. Never feel like, um, you know, because there might be an incentive involved or something of that nature. Never feel like you have to participate or move forward with something. Always understand that your concerns and questions are valid. Uh, but the research process itself does go through rigorous review. Um, and those definitely came about because of some of these unethical studies, such as the Tuskegee syphilis study and others. Um, so in a sense, we have definitely learned from the past and we are making conscious efforts to move forward um, and to be more transparent about the research process. Yeah, you know, I think it's kind of like, uh, I'm not going to, you know, use this analogy a little bit, but it's kind of like buying a car. You know, if the guy talking real fast, he wants you to sign something real quick, uh, you know, if, if it comes to your health and your um, body, sit down in that doctor chair and don't leave until you understand what's happening. You know, sometimes people feel like, hey, uh, they made me sign it. And don't nobody make, don't ever say somebody made you sign something that you didn't understand or you didn't know what was going on. You know what you can always say is, hey, let me take that home to review it. 
okay? And then if you do, you Google some stuff. If you're a person who in the internet, you call one of your cousins or somebody who you know who might have, a, you know, everybody probably got a nurse that's a, a, a cousin that's a nurse or in the medical field. And, and if you don't, you know, you know somebody at the church, at the barbershop, somebody who, who can help read over this. If it, you know, because a lot of time, unfortunately, the language that we give people to look at it's it's not written for people to really understand it. I'm gonna be honest with you sometimes, you know? And so if it's things that don't make sense, you need to, at the end of the day, even if you don't have anybody, if you say, hey, I, I don't have a cousin or an aunt or sit down, that's your doctor job. Explain this to me. Hey, I don't understand. And if he can't or she, he or she can't, then that might be something that's not for you, right? Because you really wanna make sure, especially if you're doing something that, um, you know, involves, like I said, signing papers and all this kind of stuff. You want to say, hey, I know what I'm doing. So I feel good about that because I know, you know, what's going on. You don't want to just be left in the dark and sign something just because somebody told you that was the best thing for you. So just educate yourself. And like I said, just just the doctors will take the time or they should take the time. And if they don't, like, I, again, 813-745-8000. Come to Moffitt. We don't have a timeline and that kind of stuff. I'll sit down with you. You know, people are sitting down with you and just talk, okay? Because a lot of times that's what a lot of our job is, just to educate folks and say, hey, you know, actually the guy was making a good point. This probably would be a good thing for you, you know? Or, hey, I, I, I kind of disagree and this is why. And so, um, again, just try to make sure that uh, nobody rushes, that you don't feel uh, uncomfortable with something. Because uh, like I said, here at Moffitt, we're only here to help. Exactly. And that's a great point. Even outside of clinical trials, use that for just going to doctors in general. Um, because like I said, I think about, I work for Empath Health and there's a program called PACE that my grandparents are in. And at the end of every doctor visits, their doctor is calling me. They explain to me what they discussed because they also found out too. And I think we all have our elders. They don't tell you the full story. They don't tell you the full story what the doctor just told you. They tell you what, what you want, what they think you want to hear. And so I definitely do appreciate um, that type of doctor. Not every doctor does it, but it is comforting to know that, hey, the doctor calls me after their visits and say, hey, this is what happened during their visit. Because like I said, we found out that they weren't telling me all the story. So definitely take that, take that advice outside of clinical, but take it also into just everyday life, um, especially dealing with your elders, or even dealing with your own self. So here's another question from the audience. One of the things that black males don't, dis don't care to discuss is prostate cancer. It has become obvious in recent years that males, my husband included, are finding that enlarged prostates are common, but can be moderated and managed. Is it more likely that there will be a cancer finding with this com commodity? Commonality, excuse me. So um, it's two different entities, okay? So one uh, is called benign prosthetic hypertrophy, okay? What they call BPH. And so what happens is, is that as a male uh, gets older, uh, the prostate gland actually gets larger. And sometimes uh, what happens is that where the urine comes out in a guy, it gets a little bit harder to get urine out. Or sometimes it's a little bit harder for the urine to stop and they, what they call dribble, you know, meaning that like, instead of just kind of an on off stream, sometimes it gets dribbled. Uh, I don't know, it's, it's, it's slow to stop, okay? And so that is what they call benign, meaning that it's a non-cancerous process, okay? However, the prostate being um, one of the kind of the main cancers that minority men deal with, I think it's very reasonable that if any man is having any urinary issues, not to be like, ah, uh, this is probably the one that's not cancerous causing this problem. You know what I mean? Like, like, cause then I think that's a lot of times we might say, Hey, my brother had this same problem. You know, he got it checked out. It wasn't cancerous. I'm having the same issues. So I must be good too you know? And so just what's good for the goose might not be good for the gander. And so again, uh, if you have any issues, especially if I said, if you're at a high risk population, you can't make those assumptions because those assumptions could be deadly. Okay. So while there is a non-cancerous or what they call benign issue that can happen with the prostate, there's just as likely to be a cancerous or malignant pro uh, uh, process happening in the, in the prostate that still needs to be checked out. Another question from the audience. Um, I think we, I think we kind of touched on this, but we just may want to touch on it again, um, just about being an individualized patient. Um, Al Roker from the Today Show recently had his prostate removed. Is that recommended for everyone? 
No, so um, really what happens is that, um, you know, all males have prostates. Uh, that's kind of a, a typical thing, but you could go through, you know, your whole lifetime never having any problems. Um, however, if you do develop um, uh, prostate cancer, then typically they'll try to figure out what works best for you. Okay, so in some patients, that's what they call radiation, meaning that like, if it's a small area, sometimes we can just burn it and kind of zap it, okay, and prevent it from growing and just kill it that way. All right, while well, radiation beam, you kind of land down on a table, and it takes care of that. In some folks, we have to actually do surgery to kind of remove it and kind of help really kind of take out the whole prostate gland. So it is, that is a little bit of an individual um, uh, question, uh, but there are other ways to treat prostate cancer besides just surgery um, that, like I said, we'll be happy to talk to you about. Um, come see us at Moffitt if you have any questions. All right. One of the things that we've heard in, around here recently is the effect of doctors and African-American females, or Black females. Um, there was actually something floating around the internet recently that stated, and it's very controversial, that stated police officers to black men is what doctors are to black women. How do you, and I think, and I see that narrative happening more and more where African-American females are feeling as if they're not being respected, they're not, their concerns are not being taken seriously. How do we have that conversation? Because I do see that a lot, that conversation is popping up a lot around at this point in time. Wow, that's uh, an interesting, I think, concept. Phenom, I've not heard of it um, compared in that way. Um, but I'll share on a personal level, I actually have been very intentional about um, selecting my providers. I prefer a female gynecologist. I prefer a female uh, family practice physician. Um, that's just my personal preference. And maybe, um, maybe it's well, I'm not going to say it's fed into because I feel that I haven't been heard by male providers, but I think maybe it is fed into this idea that I can talk more openly with the woman because I think that she could relate in a certain sense. So um, again, that that's a very interesting um, idea there, but I guess I can relate in that I've been intentional about who I've selected for my provider. Yeah, and the thing that I'll say um, is that sometimes that's great, right? Like if you say I have a potential um, preference, but the problem is, unfortunately, it's not a lot of us in med school. It's not a lot of us uh, out here working. You know, it's uh, we try to do the best we can, uh, even at a big place like Moffitt, you know, Tampa General, you know, some of the big uh, hospitals here uh, in the Tampa Bay area. But, you know, at the end of the day, sometimes even though you have a preference, it just might not be um, possible. OK, so what I always tell people is that uh, the squeaky wheel gets the oil. All right. And, and like I said, a lot of time in our community, we say, well, they, I, 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 they know best. You know, you know your body. Tell somebody, you know, something ain't right. And when you know something not right, you need to tell folks, because a lot of times, you know, as doctors, sometimes we go off of, uh, you know, our experience. But what our experience is in populations that look like you might be different, right? So, you know, for me, sometimes, of course, if I, I know I could pick up on something and I'm like, oh, you sure you're okay? And just me asking that extra question, you might be like, well, actually, da 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 But other communities, I mean, not saying it's a fault of theirs, they just might not be able to understand some of the nuances that you have. So in order to just not be um, kind of having a bad result, you got to tell them, like, hey, I can't breathe. I'm in pain, um, you know, this hurts, <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, and so, cause some people are like, he saw my face, he knew what, and like, that, that's not good enough, you know? Um, and and, if, and I, I'm sad that it's like that. But for our sisters, you know, a lot of times um, sisters just have really been, um, you know, kind of uh, trained sometimes just to be a little passive. And sometimes, um, you know, that's that's in all different type of regards. You know, that's why they say, you know, women make a little bit less money. Women don't negotiate as much as some of the men when it comes down to jobs, you know. So even in healthcare, you know, it's like, hey, I need y'all to speak up and say, hey, this is a problem. And, you know, and you say it till somebody, listen, they have what they call patient advocates out there. There's, you know, so if the doctor like kind of poo pooing you and you're like, ah, this lady don't know what she's talking about. Can I see a patient advocate, please? I'm having an issue and it's not being addressed. 
Okay. Those are things that will, you know, they will, you know, kind of stood up quickly, but you got to know some of these things. So, you know, I appreciate the uh, USF Alumni Association for really uh, kind of having some of these things because people might not have never even heard of a patient advocate before, but, but, but in a, in a, just keeping it simple, just the squeaky wheel gets the oil and be happy to squeak. All right. And don't think of squeaking as a bad thing. Cause again, I'm gonna say it, you got one life to live. All right. So you want to make sure that you do it uh, hopefully the best way you can. Great, great point. Now, if you can, just give us some more details on what exactly is a patient advocate. I don't want to just assume what it is and, you know, just make assumptions, but give us exactly what a patient advocate is. Yeah, so basically at most major hospitals, they have a person who will listen to the patient's concerns because sometimes what happens is the doctors or the medical team's uh, goals might be different from the patient's goals, okay? Okay. A lot of times they are, they agree, you know, like, hey, I'm sick, get me better. The doctor's like, hey, you're sick, I want to get you better. And those goals um, meet. However, sometimes they don't, you know, where, you know, the doctor is saying, hey, uh, you have, um, I don't know, let's say pneumonia, for example, but you're like, hey, my back is really hurting and this is something I can't walk. And, they, and they're like, oh, but your pneumonia is doing fine. Here's some antibiotics, you can leave the hospital. And you're like, hey, I can't walk, like my back is a problem. And as you can see, those goals are kind of different because in your mind, yeah, you know, you're happy that you're getting treatment for the pneumonia, but what's really affecting your quality of life and really kind of why you're still in the hospital, you're like, hey, um, I'm having this issue that's not really being addressed. And so the patient advocate basically becomes kind of like a middle person to kind of help just, um, you know, kind of with medical needs and, just, and they just kind of help um, be that middle person just to kind of help sh make sure that both people kind of have similar goals uh, and that whatever problems that you have, they get addressed. All right, perfect. We have a couple more questions from the audience. Um, we have so many dedicated people working on cancer treatments. Do you see promising future treatment for cancer in the pipeline you are hopeful about? Can we find a cure? So I will begin by maybe not discussing treatment per se, but talking about screening, um, screening modalities. Um, so in particular with uh, colorectal cancer, there are, there's more than one way to check for cancer and there is more than one effective way to check for it. And these effective methods of, of checking do lead to uh, more favorable outcomes as it relates to treatment. And so some that you might be familiar with, maybe from seeing commercials include, you know, Cologuard. So there are tests that you could do at home that would detect potentially if you do have cancer and then lead you to go in and to seek out treatment. Um, and so I would say that, you know, before you even get to the treatment part, and yes, to answer the question, but there is a way to make treatment even more effective by checking, detecting early. Yeah, I agree with that. Also, too, I mean, honestly, y'all, I mean, the way that medicine is changing, the last 10 years don't look like the next 10 years, okay? So what we had in 2010, people will laugh at you now if you're using that in 2020. Things are changing, okay? Um, you know, people always kind of say, hey, will we find a cure? There are some cancers that are curable. I'm going to say that again for the people in the back. There are some cancers that are curable. OK, so when people say find a cure for cancer, cancer is like a, a blanket statement. You know, it's kind of like saying, um, you know, a vehicle. Vehicle could mean a van, could mean a car, could mean a truck, could mean a semi. Like, you know, it's so many types of things that, you know, you can say that. And so, and so, yeah, they all have wheels, but you already know they're not the same. They don't have the same number, you know, motorcycles, you know, it's so many types of things. So to say that, uh, is there a cure for cancer? There's so many different types of cancer. Some are curable. And so the number that will be curable will keep going up and up because technology is changing, medicine is changing. Um, and so, um, like I said, but a lot of times that depends on being detected early. And that's what I think Dr. Ewan was talking about is that, you know, if we, if we got some things that can cure you, meaning that like had cancer, no longer has cancer, cancer won't come back, you got to necessarily catch it early. And so that's where the screening and some of those things kind of come into play because a lot of times it's stuff that we could do, meaning that like, hey, is the doctor offering you a procedure or a test that could potentially detect something? Don't be scared. You know, and, and just say, hey, you know, because sometimes that's what people say, I'd rather not know. It's like, all right, 
Just yeah. know you could potentially kill yourself. You know, I mean, I'm just being honest because even if we find some people like, oh, I got cancer, but like you, you don't know that because a lot of times we could take it out. Boom, quick surgery. Boom, it's you're out and you're done. You know, or you know, or, you know, and so there's just so many things, or maybe even radiation may not even need surgery. So just know that a lot of times we can fix it, but we got to know about it first. And so that's where the screening, that's where the doctor's visits come into. And I know it sounded like we're saying the same stuff over and over again, but I'm telling you, these are some of the steps that you can do to really make sure you're around here with your grandkids, your great grandkids, and that uh, that you want to see them grow up and graduate, get married. You know, you know, you want to dance, do the let you slide at their uh, weddings and stuff, but you got to be around for that. And and that's why we're here to have this conversation today. Exactly. And speaking of 10 years versus 20 years, you know, electric slide that Dan Dr. Blue, we're doing a wobble right now. So I need you to, you know, just like research, <laughs> things change. All right. <laughs> <laughs> so a, here's another question for the audience. At a recent visit, my doctor said something was precancerous. What does that mean? Yeah, so this is a great question. So, um, all right, without getting too sciencey, okay, just know that when something is cancerous, a lot of times that means that it is growing at a way that is kind of destroying other things around it, okay? Meaning that cancer typically doesn't like to play nice, okay? It doesn't like to sit in its seat, all right, where it's supposed to be. It like to kind of stretch its arms out. And like, have you ever been on a plane, you know, and it's somebody who really kind of leaning over on your side and you're like, hey man, like this not your space. That's what cancer likes to do. So sometimes what they do is they see that while this uh, cancer is really not at a point where it's leaning over into the other aisle, it's pretty close, okay? And they see like little subtle changes where it's like, hey, if we don't take care of this person or take care of this little uh, pre-cancer, then a lot of times they turn into cancer. And so if you remember that kind of train going on the tracks um, analogy that I use, sometimes we can actually catch the train before it leaves. And so that's the best case scenario because typically we can kind of redirect it to kind of go a different way. And so um, so pre and, and like I said, without knowing more of the details of of exactly the, uh, the what happened but typically that's the case most pre-cancers if you detect them early we have ways of kind of steering that train away from going down the cancer road and actually going down a hey i don't have to worry about this anymore but however sometimes that does mean you need to get checked more frequently and that you got to follow up a little bit closer because hey we did find something and we don't want um we don't want it to turn into be cancerous all right we have another question for the audience and we have about roughly about 10 more minutes so you know, we definitely keep these questions going as much as we can. Any question that we can't get within this time frame, we'll definitely send it out to our panelists and they will answer it and we'll try to get it out as well. Um, according to some reports, Dr. Hadia Nicole has become the first person to successfully cure cancer in mice using laser active nanoparticles. Additionally, treatment didn't require chemotherapy, radiation, or surgery. Is this a treatment that Moffitt is considering? Is it too early to use? Yeah, so typically when you have things that are tested in mice, it's at least seven to 10 years before we try them in humans. So uh, so that's, we have a lot of studies here at Moffitt where we see something that's good for a mouse, but then we try it in a human and it just doesn't have the same effect. So um, there's a lot of things that are exciting. We have multiple uh, like conferences where people share a lot of uh, scientific knowledge. Uh, and so um, that's definitely something that's exciting. Um, but like I said, we're probably a good seven to 10 years away from being able to test any of these things uh, in humans. Uh, and so, um, and, and again, I wanna say this again, um, you know, curing cancer, you know, it's so many different types that uh, we need to, you know, be kind of conscious of that, of that what works for breast cancer might not work for colon cancer and lung cancer. So um, just kind of keep that in mind. I just want to kind of add into that, but on a different note, you know, when Dr. Blue talks about what's good for one cancer, it's not good for another. Let's take um, HPV and cervical cancer as an example. We have a vaccine um, that could prevent one type of cancer. Um, and so we're, we're not yet there with some of the other types of cancers, right? So just to give another example of how some advances um, are present for certain cancers, but not necessarily others. All right, perfect. Another question, what's an example of what is changing in cancer treatment? 
So um, the biggest change over the past, I don't know, 10, 12 years is what they call immunotherapy. Okay, so before what we used to have is traditional chemotherapy. All right, that's what you have seen. I don't know in the movies and all that kind of stuff, people losing their hair, vomiting, and you know all these kind of crazy side effects. What happened with chemotherapy is that chemotherapy was like a big bomb. Okay, it killed good cells, bad cells. It didn't care. It was just killing everything. Okay, because that's what chemotherapy does. So a lot of people had a lot of different side effects because it killed a lot of their good cells. Okay, this good cells would come back, but you know it just would. It, it's a rough go. However, this immunotherapy, if you can think about it being like maybe like a sniper. A sniper can kind of look and see, is this a good cell? Oh, let me leave that alone. All right, there's a cancer cell, let me take care of it, you know? And so, and so that's one of the biggest things. And most cancers have an immunotherapy component where that now we don't see all the like side effects and all the like problems that we have. And we can give it to people into their 80s where before people would kind of say, well, you, you know, you 75, you had a good life, you know? But now we have a, a, a more effective way and a gentler way of giving treatment so that people can do it well into uh, older age and it still have a great effect on the treatment. So that's, that's literally the, the biggest advancement that has come out. All right, another question. These are, and I'll tell you, these are great questions. Um, oftentimes- I think they're even better answers, but go ahead. <laughs> oh, look at here, look at here. <laughs> just joking, just joking. Keep it light. Let's keep it light. Keep it light. As always, as always. That's what we do. But I wouldn't expect nothing else from somebody from Hollywood High. So, <laughs> oftentimes, people won't go to doctors or this because of the barrier of affordability. What advice and our programs are in place to help encourage people to get prevention, preventive screenings while not accruing large amounts of medical debt? Wow, that last part, that last part almost <laughs> took it out. Um, the first part, though, what um, what other places are there? So we've talked a lot about Moffitt Cancer Center, but a lot of people don't live in cities that are, um, you know, near, near an NCI-designated cancer center. So I wanted to bring up federally qualified health care centers. These centers um, are funded through federal dollars, and oftentimes they do provide services on a sliding fee scale. Um, so you'll go in, you'll share what your um, income is with them, and then they will share with you what the fee for services are. So um, I do want to encourage you to explore those type of uh, clinics that are available to you um, in different areas, especially if you're not able to get into, you know, a Mafi Cancer Center. Um, they do treat acute conditions. So again, not just cancer, right? But if you do need to go for a routine um, checkup of any nature, and then also some do have oral health services as well. Yeah, another thing, you know, um, I do want to kind of toot Moffitt's horn a little bit on this. So we actually have a financial department that'll work with you, all right? We have uh, some people that qualify for what they call Moffitt charity. It's some folks that come in here and don't pay nothing, okay? But, you know, you got to qualify for it. So if, if you need help and if you're at a place where, um, like, hey, there's some things that you really can't afford, Moffitt got money typically to help you out in some kind of way. I can't say if you're going to be, you know, leaving here with no, you know, zero dollars, but at least they should be able to help offset. And um, they have programs and stuff that we have here that other places might not have the resources to help you with. Um, so, um, again, and, and these are even preventative services. So, for example, Moffitt has what they call a mammogram van. They got a van that drive around Tampa Bay trying to give women breast cancer screening. Okay, Moffitt has uh, the Cola Guard program where they're giving people cola, uh, to check for colon cancer. So we have things that we are doing to help the community um, on the front end when it's like, you know, screening for cancer or in pre-cancer. But we for sure, um, if, if it turns out, unfortunately, that one of these screening comes back positive, don't say, oh, man, I don't have no money for, you know, cancer treatment, because a lot of times we can work with you again. But it, you got to dial that number, give us a call, come see us, and we'll be more than happy to help you. One other resource uh, would be the American Cancer Society. So I know that's a very, you know, familiar place that a lot of us are, are, do know about. So start there, you know, if you're unsure about how to pay for something. Exactly. And then also, too, just to add, um, if you do, do your research on what Medicaid and Medicare provides as well, 
because that provides a lot of benefits to individuals as well. So definitely do your research on that. Um, that's a whole another conversation, but just to toss that out there. Yeah, it is. Actually, I'm yeah. glad you brought that up because one other area that's important that I don't think many people know about is the linkage between policy and healthcare. And so you, you did mention Medicaid, Medicare. Florida is actually a state that did not expand Medicaid um, with the Affordable Care Act. And so I wanted to say this is an opportunity to also encourage us to be more knowledgeable about, about what our politicians are advocating for, because that in and of itself could help, you know, millions of people, thousands of people be able to afford, you know, health care. Definitely. Thank you. As we get ready to wrap up, we're going to do some closing statements. But before we wrap up, Dr. Ewan, everybody's trying to figure out in your background, they want to see your background. It's brought back a lot of memories. You know, some people are, you know, what's love got to do with it? Others are back to 227. I think I see your boy down there from Soul Glow. Uh, if you can, uh, we see, you know, we see the original Michael Jackson, but that's besides the point. If oh, yeah. you can. <laughs> If you can, explain to us what your background is. Yeah, definitely. If you can see this image, and if you have had any of these hairstyles or you continue to rock any of these hairstyles, it's time for you to have a colonoscopy. So I need for you to call that number uh, that's been shared uh, for Moffitt Cancer Center or talk to your provider about scheduling that. Yeah. And if you're still rocking those hairstyles, I need you to call your hairstylist, too, and schedule switching that up as well. <laughs> But that's but that's a whole another conversation too. All right. <laughs> Any closing remarks from Dr. Blue or uh, Dr. Ewing? I think this is a great, uh, great event, great platform. Thank you, USF Alumni Association, for taking advantage of you know you know what COVID has given us through opportunities, and I think that's to reach out to more people virtually. I think more people are becoming familiar with Zoom and working that, and you know Facebook Live and different sessions. So. Um, one, you know, thank you. And two, um, share this with family members. You know, if you've learned anything from this session today, don't keep that information to yourself. Um, your knowledge and your voice could definitely help, you know, inform, influence, and save potentially somebody else's life. So I just want to encourage you, again, during this holiday season, you know, while you may not be traveling in person, you know, pick up the phone or, or send out that Zoom link to talk to your family members about, you know, health, cancer, cancer screening. Um, you could definitely save a life. Perfect. Thank you. Yeah. And um, like I said, I just wanted to uh, appreciate everyone for who, who took the time to actually listen to us kind of ramble and talk uh, about cancer prevention, cancer screening, cancer treatment um, um, for this uh, time period. That's what the first step is, is kind of really getting education. Um, but then what the next step is, you take the education that you have and you share with others, you know, each one, teach one, reach one. Right. And so we just want to make sure that, you um, you know, here, again, I, I keep saying this again, and Moffitt, we're just here to help folks. And uh, we really want to be a resource to the community, let people know that, hey, if you got questions, don't be scared to ask, be your own advocate. Uh, and really, uh, if you're at a place where you're like, hey, I feel uncomfortable with the care that I'm receiving, just know that it's second opinions and there's other people out there who can potentially help you, okay? So if there's other questions and stuff, I'm sure they'll uh, have a mechanism to kind of send that our way, but we just here to help. And um, I appreciate y'all for tuning in and I appreciate y'all for inviting me to come talk to you. And we definitely appreciate you, Dr. Blue and Dr. Ewan, because you all have definitely given some extraordinary and great answers um, to a lot of the questions. And so we definitely appreciate you giving up your time to be here today with us. Um, as always, as we spoke about earlier, thank you for joining USF Black Alumni Society in partnership with Moffitt Cancer Center. As tomorrow, we'll be focusing on health and oral screenings. And on Thursday, December 10th, we'll focus on integrative health. But again, we thank you all for joining us and we look forward to having you guys, ever have everybody join us tomorrow for our next discussion. But again, thank you, Dr. Blue, and thank you, Dr. Ewan, for this moment, this time. All right, thank you.